the state of the race. Sky News has teamed up with YouGov to find out. And here it is. On the basis of this, is Truss will be heading into Downing Street on September 6th. She gets a, has a commanding lead. 66% say that they would vote for her. 34% say they would vote for Whitney. Now, slight tightening of Even bigger lead there for Liz Truss. What about people that haven't? Does Rishi Sunak have a chance? Well, he, amongst people who haven't yet voted, 29% say that they voted for him, 44% say they voted for Liz Truss. But look at this, 26% say they don't know. That needs over half of these people to go to Rishi Sunak's corner in order for him to have any kind of chance. The numbers just are so difficult at this stage. But what are the challenges that whoever takes over will face. This poll gave us some clues. The affection that this party has, the Conservative Party for Boris Johnson, evident in this. We asked, what if Boris Johnson was actually on the ballot paper and he wins by a landslide? 46% say they'd vote for him, 24% for Liz Truss, 23% for Rishi Sunak. This group of people, the Conservative Party, quite clear, they don't think Boris Johnson should have been slung out of number 10 at all in this poll. But what of the toxicity of this race? Lots of mudslinging. But has it rebounded on the membership? Well, the answer appears yes for a big minority. We asked whether Liz Truss should include Rishi Sunak in her, her cabinet. 52% say yes. But look at this. Over a third of the Conservative Party say that the man that took the Conservative Party and the government and the country through the pandemic and wanted to be Prime Minister should be left out of the next Prime Minister's cabinet. That's quite a degree of dislike, of hatred, uh, that the next... Together, we have laid foundations that will stand the test of time, whether by taking back control of our laws or putting in vital new infrastructure. Great, solid masonry on which we will continue to build together. Paving, paving the path of prosperity now and for future generations. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Your Majesty, Prime Minister. Thank you. Your Majesty. Very good to see you. Very kind of come in. I know how you're busy. You too. I know. Anyway, we, but um, I mean, we mustn't take But it's been so touching uh, this afternoon when we arrived here. All those people mm. come to give their condolences. Your flowers. Majesty, my very, very sincere. You're very kind. They're all very kind. It's the moment I've been dreading, mm. as, as I know a lot of people have. But mm. Mm. try and keep everything going. Absolutely. Come, come, Thank come. you. Come and see. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today 
because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. And we owe her the most heartfelt debt any family could owe to their mother for her love, affection, guidance, understanding, and example. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Alongside the personal grief that all my family are feeling, we also share with so many of you in the United Kingdom, in all the countries where the Queen was head of state, in the Commonwealth and across the world, a deep sense of gratitude for the more than 70 years in which my mother as Queen served the people of so many nations. In 1947, on her 21st birthday, she pledged in a broadcast from Cape Town to the Commonwealth to devote her life, whether it be short or long, to the service of her peoples. That was more than a promise. It was a profound personal commitment which defined her whole life. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great 
as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. And as every member of my family can testify, she combined these qualities with warmth, humor, and an unerring ability always to see the best in people. I pay tribute to my mother's memory, and I honor her life of service. I know that her death brings great sadness to so many of you, and I share that sense of loss beyond measure with you all. When the Queen came to the throne, Britain and the world were still coping with the privations and aftermath of the Second World War, and still living by the conventions of earlier times. In the course of the last 70 years, we have seen our society become one of many cultures and many faiths. The institutions of the state have changed in turn. But through all changes and challenges, our nation and the wider family of realms, of whose talents, traditions, and achievements I am so inexpressibly proud, have prospered and flourished. Our values have remained, and must remain, constant. The role and the duties of monarchy also remain, as does the sovereign's particular relationship and responsibility towards the Church of England, the church in which my own faith is so deeply rooted. In that faith and the values it inspires, I have been brought up to cherish a sense of duty to others and to hold in the greatest respect the precious traditions, freedoms, and responsibilities of our unique history and our system of parliamentary government. As the Queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love as I have throughout my life. My life will, of course, change as I take up my new responsibilities. It will no longer be possible for me to give so much of my time and energies to the charities and issues for which I care so deeply. But I know this important work will go on in the trusted hands of others. This is also a time of change for my family. I count on the loving help of my darling wife, Camilla. In recognition of her own loyal public service since our marriage 17 years ago, she becomes my queen consort. I know she will bring to the demands of her new role the steadfast devotion to duty on which I have come to rely so much. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles which have meant so much to me. He succeeds me as Duke of Cornwall and takes on the responsibilities for the Duchy of Cornwall, which I have undertaken for more than five decades. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wysog Cymru, the country whose title I have been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to 
bring the marginal to the centre ground where vital help can be given. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. In a little over a week's time, we will come together as a nation, as a commonwealth, and indeed a global community, to lay my beloved mother to rest. In our sorrow, let us remember and draw strength from the light of her example. On behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. And to my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this, thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Right. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. 